Well, how many are excited to be in church today? It's a good day. If you love Jesus, it's always a good day uh, to come together and to encourage each other. I love it. Uh, it's, again, as we gather together, it, I love the chance that we have. Those that were here last week, last week was just a blast. I love that we get to do uh, Sundays like that, and we tease a lot. You don't know what you're going to get when you show up at Radiant Church. You just don't know. And uh, God's got something great, and those that are guests, we're so glad that you're here. And just one before we start, I, I want to give us a little peek behind the curtain, uh, a little bit as to the operational aspect. Aspects of, of who we are at Radiant Church and, and how we kind of move forward um, in both accountability and really in our mission. And uh, one of the things that is kind of maybe a little unique in that we are as a part of a tribe and uh, our bigger tribe, the Assemblies of God, through, the, through our tribe, our pastors that serve on staff here, myself included, we are held accountable um, theologically and accountable morally and, and all the different dynamics that take place and what it means to, to serve as a pastor within, within that framework. And with that, sometimes we know there's some confrontation, maybe that happens, we hope not, but and how we lead and how we are personal, but we have three uh, people that serve as advisory elders for us, and these are leaders outside of here, but have, but if you say so, authority into my life. So if there are things that are happening that they can speak into it, and what I'm really looking forward to is it looks like this next year we're going to be able to have all three of them come and speak at different points. You guys are just incredibly uh, godly men in that role for us. But on the local level, we have, um, we, we call executive elders. Uh, we are one church in many locations, and so we have a board of executive elders that serve here locally. They are men and women who carry the spiritual weight of the mission of Radiant Church. Uh, they, they are here to, they're spiritual leaders, recognize the spiritual leaders, and they're responsible to God to keep us on mission. Uh, they're, they're holding responsibility towards what God has called us to be on mission, to stay purpose. There's, there's also as well as accountability with our financial well-being. Uh, they don't handle all the day-to-day, but they make sure that we are within boundaries and, and the framework of how we do things so that we're healthy. And, and the way that we choose those executive elders is um, once a year, we have what we call our vision night. And at the vision night is kind of a chance to come together. It'll be on Wednesday, uh, March 6th. And we're, we just celebrate what God's done and where he's taken us. We talk about where God's leading us. And one of the things we kind of lay over, open the finances and just say, hey, here's where we're at. Let's just be honest and put our, put our cards face face up and uh, let's, let's move forward. And we present names that the way it is, is the pastors and the executive elders come together and pray, say who should be serving that role. Our executive elders serve three-year terms and they're allowed to serve up to three consecutive terms right, in, in, in a row. And so we have two names that we're putting forward before you. And I need to tell you that now before that meeting. And uh, we have uh, Gary Smalley and Gary has been serving already two terms as an executive elder for us. He's one of them going on on the trip, serves in, in many different ministry areas here around the church. And the other is Debbie Modricek. Uh, Debbie has been a significant part of our church for a long time and just in, and pr- previously had been on staff, but now serving in our freedom ministry and overseeing, helping oversee our prayer teams. And uh, I bring those names before you because over the next couple of weeks, if there's any reason that you think that there's a reason that we should say, hey, those aren't the spiritual leaders, they're not really, maybe that's something that maybe we're not aware of, we need to be made aware. And so we always throw that out just for accountability's sake, saying, hey, if you know something, if they're not spiritual leaders, come talk to us, come talk to me, and I would love to hear and talk. We always want to make sure that we're following God. And uh, at that night, those that are members, and I don't like that term membership because it doesn't really fit what we do, but you know, it's a word. Um, and so, but what we, to be a member at Radiant Church, nobody, you don't need to be, but it's people that voluntarily say, pastor, we're going to hold the mission of this church together. We're all in. We're all in on the mission of this church. We're in financially. We're in serving. This is our, this is, we are the church. We're in. And uh, so those that are kind of owners of that mission uh, come together and we, we just make sure that we vote together and just kind of affirm people in leadership positions. And so I just want to make sure that you're aware of that as we're coming up to that date as we celebrate what God is doing. So enough of the behind the scenes. So this week we start a brand new series and I'm excited about this series. We're going we're talking we're going to be going through a series we're calling Flourish. And that against all odds God wants you to flourish. Do you know that? Like, do you really understand that that against all odds God created you and wants you to flourish. And in the series I'm looking forward to it because it's going to lead us up to Easter that God wants you to flourish in your identity. 
He wants you to flourish in the way the spirit works in your life. He wants you to flourish in your relationships. He even wants you to flourish in tragedies, in the midst of difficult circumstances. He wants you to flourish in your work and help you have joy and purpose in everything you do. So to help us kind of get started, I want to lay just a framework, one of the great passages for this. Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 92, okay? Grab your, whether it's on your your tablet or on your phone, or you have the hard copy and you're old school like that, Um, turn to Psalm 92. Psalm 92 is a song to be sung on the Sabbath day. Uh, This is what it says. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to the Most High. It is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning, your faithfulness in the evening, accompanied by a 10-string instrument, a harp, and melody of a lyre. You thrill me, Lord, with all that you have done for me. I sing for joy because of what you have done. Oh, Lord, what great works you do, and how deep are your thoughts. Only a simpleton would not know, and only a fool would not understand this. That though the wicked sprout like weeds and evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, O Lord, will be exalted forever. Your enemies, Lord, will surely perish. All evildoers will be scattered. But you have made me as strong as a wild ox. You have anointed me with the finest oils. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies and my ears have heard the defeat of my wicked opponents. Verse 12, I love this. But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our Lord. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. And everyone over 50 says amen and praise the Lord. Right? They will deserve the Lord is just he is, they will declare the Lord is just. He is my rock. There is no evil in him. What I want to do today is just kind of lay that theological foundation of an understanding of why we are to flourish. And, and it's going to be a little bit deeper, maybe a little bit more theological today, than, uh, but we're going to get real practical, hopefully at the end, kind of stick with me as we wrestle with some things. But I really want to help us understand the need that we have in helping us see how God wants us to flourish, seeing God's perspective in this, because the perspective of the psalmist is this, that even in your old age, you are going to continue to flourish. You're not just going to live. You're not just going to make it. You're going to produce fruit. Right? By flourish, we mean this. We're, we're defining it this way. To grow in a healthy and vigorous way, especially as a result of a favorable environment. Or to grow healthy and vigorous, and depending upon the environment. Or we're not talking just about living. God's talking about growing. Right? He wants you to grow in health and strength. He doesn't want you just to exist. He doesn't want you just to make it through the day, but to continually grow. And we've been talking about this year. We're not just two years on repeat, but we are. the older we get, the, the deeper we should get. Right? The more we, we spend time with the Lord, the more vibrant our lives should be. And a lot of times when we're older, we look back and go, oh, I wish when I was younger, I had all that energy and vit and vinegar. And uh, I'm old too. I don't talk like that. But, um, <laughs> right? but, but, it's, it's, but it's a reminder. No, no, no. My best days are still ahead. My best days are still ahead. The problem is though, we live in an environment. We live in a world that beats us and tries to subdue us. But God wants your spirit that he's put in you to be in an environment that thrives, right? That you have a peace and a joy and a love. And we're going to do this. We're going to look at it. So I want to see how, why it is that way. So we're going to go back all the way to the beginning. So take your Bibles back to Genesis chapter 1. Okay, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go to the very beginning and walk through this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry around the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Then, blessed, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. 
passage is, is so important because I think all of us can understand, right? There is something unique about being human. There is a uniqueness in humanity. Uh, there are those that want to say that humans are just a natural outgrowth of once life started, that it would eventually evolve and become to where humans are today, that it's just a, a simple evolutionary path that would end here, that we are simply expansions of what has happened before, an outgrowth of what has happened. But for most of us, like we intrinsically know that that just doesn't seem right. That intrinsically, there's something different in humanity that is, that is unique about us. Something special, right? All life has value, but there is something unique about humanity. And what I want to do today is I want to, I want to dive into uh, a little bit of this. And so we're going to do a little, little theology here for, for a second. And, and as, as we do, here's, what, here's the fun part about theologians. Theologians just usually like to argue about nuances of words. <laughs> That's what they do. So I'm just going to oversimplify some things. Uh, but the fun part, too, about theologians is they like to give us really cool words um, and say, hey, we're going, to, we're going to explain this in either Greek, Hebrew, or German because it makes us sound smarter. And so what we're going to look at from that verse today is this concept called Imago Dei. Imago Dei is literally just the translation, image of God. All right, and that passage said, image of God. And Imago Dei means, what does it mean to be created in God's image? And what we're saying is this, that we were created, you and I were created to uniquely reflect God in our being, in our authority, in our relationships, and in our capacity to create. That you and I, the person sitting next to you, you and that sitting in that seat, you were created to uniquely reflect God in your being, in your authority, in your relationship, and your capacity to create. Or the creator of life itself came and breathed his life into us. It's his breath that created our life. He put a piece of God in each and every one of us. And we see it throughout the scripture that you and I are called to reflect his glory that we carry a purpose and a capacity that's unique to God and unique in relationship to the rest of his creation. And so there's four things that, that I wanna, that we talked about, right? Being, authority, relationship, capacity to create that I wanna just simplify a little bit. So the first is this. We are in, every human being we're created in the image of God has been created with an eternal identity. Every human being has been created with an eternal identity identity. We were created in God's image in both form and function. Form, we have an eternal spirit that God has breathed within us and function that there is our purpose and our capacity is unique. And what this means is that every human being has infinite dignity. Every human being has infinite dignity. They have infinite dignity. It doesn't matter their intellect. It doesn't matter their perceived beauty. It doesn't matter their financial status. It doesn't matter their race. It doesn't matter anything. All of us have infinite dignity. And it's so important that we get that, right? Because every one of us has a piece of God in us that makes us unique and marks us for eternity. Not just for a little bit. We are marked for eternity with a unique aspect of who God is within us. And I think all of us, every person, if you push, doesn't matter what culture, background, where somebody is, if you push on them, they say, yeah, there just something seems right about that, right? That when there's injustice in the world, don't you just like go, no, that's, that's not right. People shouldn't be treated that way. Like there's a sense of injustice, a way people are being treated in, incorrectly that rises up within us because we know that that's just not right. Humans, there's more value in them than how they're being treated. The second thing about being in the image of God is this, that humanity has been given the authority and the responsibility to establish order and purpose in God's creation. That we have been given authority, and whenever you have authority, you have a responsibility. That the two go hand in hand. Authority with responsibility. If you give somebody a responsibility without authority, uh, that's slavery. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It's, it's, and some of us are going to go talk to our bosses. Responsibility, no authority. I'm just going to stop meddling and be quiet. All right. And so establish, but it, because when God created Eden, he created Eden perfect. It, it was established. It was ordered. Adam and Eve's job was to go forth from Eden eventually and bring order to the chaos in the rest of the world. It was always God's plan to be able to expand. And they, you saw that in the passage that given that humanity has the ability to shape and understand and multiply the good and minimize the chaos of creation. 
I, you see this as we've, time has gone by and we have more and more people. Isn't it amazing how we feed everybody? <laughs> right? I love the farmers that are in Iowa. I love the, the work that's done just even on the understanding of genetics and understanding of weeds and all the different dynamics that are in place of how do we feed? How do we multiply? How do we get higher yield and all those pieces because we were given a God-given authority and responsibility for that to happen. The third thing, The image of God means every human has been given a prophetic relationship with God that can call forth life and purpose. Every human has been given a prophetic relationship with God that can call forth life and purpose. You were created to hear the voice of God. You and I were created to hear God's voice. And then you can take what he says and you can repeat it with a similar level of impact with a similar level of life-giving and multiplying fruit that comes from that. Right? And I use the word prophecy here because most people think of, when they think of prophecy, they think of fore, forth, or foretelling, like they're gonna tell the future. But the Bible doesn't use prophecy that way the majority of the time. The majority of the time, the Bible uses prophecy as forthtelling. This is what God said. I'm gonna tell you what God said. And when I say what God said, there's an impact in how God has said that. We hear God's word and we share his words with others, right? So this, and, and again, why is it that so many of us, doesn't matter our culture, our background, we know when something's right and we know when something's wrong. It's interesting, we have so many different people from different nationalities and nations that are part of Radiant and talked to different ones and, and some have said like, hey, yeah, in my home culture, my home country, um, things are very corrupt. And even when corruption is the norm, everyone knows it shouldn't be. Why is that? Because they say, well, there's a conscience. There's a little voice. No, no, we were created to hear God's voice. And God's word calls out what is right. And every time something, we know something is right is because it calls forth life and purpose. And we know something is wrong because it diminishes dignity and value in others. Right? We, there's, there's an intrinsic sense in us to know those things. So every human right, has been created with eternal identity. Human, humanity has been given authority and responsibility to establish order and purpose in God's creation. Every human has been given a prophetic relationship with God that can call forth life and purpose. Hanging with me? Good, we've got one more. Okay, here we go. The fourth thing is humans are driven by a unique intelligence and imagination to create what we haven't seen. And just think, think, for example, I don't know if you've ever been around a sheep. I've never seen a sheep that had a dream. And once they had a dream, that they had a dream about building a fort that they could live in that would be more comfortable than living out in the, in the grass where they were. And that sheep then went to, get, went to work to build that fort. I've never seen it happen. And yet little kids do it all the time. All right, I've never seen, I've never seen a dog, no matter how intelligent and smart your dog is, have a dream about a dragon and then go out in the snow when it's all packy and, and you can put things together and build that dragon out of snow and make that beautiful. I've just never seen it. And yet teenagers even do that all the time, right? You know, like, like it's just, we, we have a, humans have a capacity to process, imagine, and then work to create what they've thought. Like, it's so powerful. It's so beautiful. That's why art is such an incredible thing, right? Whether it's music or painting or, or dance, or we, have, we can express some things that didn't even exist before. We can put motion to it and beauty to it and, and, and multiply it. And I think of all the engineers that we have in our community, right? What is engineering? Engineering is truly utilizing the building blocks that God has put in place and then using them in different ways to multiply effectiveness and the ability to do things. That's because God has created us with that capacity. We have been given, like our, our world is very different today. When you look at what God created originally and you read through scripture, His goal was always, he started in a garden, but when you read Revelation chapter 21, the goal is always to end in a city, right? He he put this in motion because it's through us that we are to reflect his glory. He put amazing things inside of us, shaped by God to be a reflection of him on this world. So why is our world so broken? Let's flip ahead, just two chapters, Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, it says the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? 
Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit in the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you'll die. Verse four, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The enemy came in. The enemy of God came in, deceived humanity, and shattered the pure imago Dei within us. He, he deceived us. And in that deception, the purity of our ability to fully reflect God, the way that we were created to reflect, has been shattered. And he used this deception. This is the great deception. When you read it right here, here it is. The deception is you can flourish without God. That is the greatest deception that has ever been laid before any of us, that you have the capacity to flourish without God. We were created as a reflection of God. He's placed himself in us. Without him, we are just, we're similar to everything else. But with him, his eternal spirit is in us. But Satan says, no, 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 you can flourish without God. And that deception has broken our path and broken our, our, the fullness of who we are that exists even to this day. And in some ways, like we were created to be a reflection of God. It's like looking in a mirror. We were to hold that up to God, and, and then that reflection of it, we could see him and encounter him. And in that moment, when we dis- humanity decided that, no, we're going we're gonna to do it, our, we can flourish without God, that reflective image was shattered. It was absolutely shattered, right? And, and like a mirror when it's broken into hundreds of pieces. And what we've done as humanity over time, because there's still things within us that are there. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to piece it back together. We've tried to piece little pieces of, of who we are back together and, and you get the mirror and, and, and it reflects. But no matter how you look at it, it's always broken. It's always distorted. You're never going to see a full picture of who you were created or meant to be. And when we take those same four principles of the Imago Dei and see what they look like now that they've been shattered, it looks like this. First thing, we have traded our eternal identity for death. Now we are defined, aren't we? Each of us, we're defined by our mortal life. It's the little dates with a little dash in between. That's what defines us. It's not our eternal identity that defines us. And therefore, you and I have to work and create our value and our worth before we die. The only value that's in our life is what we create and manufacture before we die. And what this does is it allows us to put ourselves before others. Now I can put myself in front of someone else who also might have dignity and value and worth, but I have to get value out of my life before it's over. This is the moment that I have. Or even though we know it's wrong, right? Why, why is it that corruption can, can exist? Like we know it's wrong internally, but we push it aside. And even the value and dignity of somebody else can be stepped on because everything is just temporal. I need to do it now before my time runs out because my value has a limit. The second thing that's happened is we've now traded God-given authority and responsibility for the power of self-determination. Well, was a God-given authority in our lives. Now it is self-determined. We no longer feel responsible for the world, for others. We don't even feel responsible for community. But the other part is we don't have the authority, the same authority to shape it. And when we don't have authority, we use power. And even when we try to create community, because we know there should be something that we work together, right? We're supposed to build this together. It's supposed to work together. Somebody then steps in and takes control and power overrides everything else. I'm determined to make something great. I will do it. I will make sure that this happens because I'm the one that needs to see this through. And it's in our self-determination that we create our own sense of value and worth and dignity And if you can't make that for yourself, tough on you. Now we think about what is it then that's in the benefit for me, not necessarily what's in the benefit for God's kingdom. The third thing that happens because of the shattered image we have, we've traded a relationship with God for slavery to sin. Now we are, we had a relationship with God. We could hear his voice. And then we've traded that relationship with God for us to flourish, to be a pure reflection of him. And now we have sin. And what sin is this, I have a short life 
and I have the power to make of it what I will. And I can flourish without God. And what it does is every time we look to try to get a sense of our reflection and who we are, it's warped, it's distorted, there's missing pieces, but we're driven by it because it's the only picture we know. We were trying to, it's kind of like right, that image has been shattered. And what we're trying to do anymore is we're trying to put these pieces back together to reflect God, but we're building it off of, it's like putting a puzzle together and you have the wrong picture altogether. You just can't do it. You can't see it. You can't imagine how that works. And the fourth thing, because of that shattered image of God, we've traded the drive to create beauty for a nature to divide. Male and female. He created us to be, to work together, to flourish, to populate the, the world, to be in unity together, to build families, right? To be a pure reflection of him. But now we have such a shattered and broken sexuality that, that all of us struggle, right? That we struggle with this broken sexuality, that we, we even see massive divorce rates among us, right? We, we see children who are abandoned and traumatized because of the lack of care in a family and the brokenness in a home. We know that beauty and family should be, like there's still that drive on a wedding day that this should be beautiful, this should be perfect, but our brokenness just simply multiplies drama, and we all love good drama, let's be honest, right? Like it makes for good TV. <laughs> I mean, you watch some reality TV shows, right? All it is is the division that is being put into something that's supposed to be united. And that drama just multiplies over and over. But you see, God created us to flourish by being a reflection of his glory. But sin came in and shattered that image. It shattered it. And now we're trying to create life, but we're doing it out of a broken image, we're doing it out of our brokenness. And, and what this means is you cannot flourish when you are looking through the shattered image of humanity. If you're trying to flourish by looking through the shattered image of humanity, we got mirror pieces and you're trying to say, well, this is what it should be. And this is how it, you'll never fully flourish because it's broken. It reflects the wrong things. It's the wrong times. And can, can I poke the bear a little bit on this to give you an example? Okay. All right. You ready? Brace yourselves environmentalism. All of a sudden, be like, ooh, what side is he on? <laughs> Which is immediately shows the brokenness of humanity. Yeah. That there would be a side, right? That there would be a side that we're on. You and I were created with the responsibility and the authority to care for God's creation. We saw that clearly in Genesis chapter 1. But now we only see it through a shattered human perspective. It's a political perspective as a first and foremost. Like we're going to grab a, a political perspective, my side, your side. And you got one group that looks at it and says, well, there is no eternity. Or there is no eternal life. There is no eternal dignity. And so, and, and we're, we're, so therefore, all I have is what's here right now. And so I need to figure out how we can control it because I can flourish without God. And it's created their own religion created their own religion around, uh, around the environment and how those things kind of work together. But then we got groups on the other side that have completely abdicated responsibility, abdicated responsibility for what God has called us to and, 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 and allowed greed and self-determination to drive what it means to, to care for the fuller. Like as long as I take care of my yard, I'm like my yard's good and my, I'm doing the thing that I can be in my yard. Have you ever noticed that it doesn't matter where you are, people like to have a nice yard? It's a little bit, it's tied back into how we were created. There's a little bit in there. He wanted us to do that. But the problem is, we, both of those perspectives are wrong. Because we need to see, how do we reflect God's purpose? How do we call forth life and hope into the world? How do we work together so he is glorified? Oh, it's hard to see. I'm not telling you. Neither, right? It's all broken. <laughs> but here's what I'm getting at. We know we are seeing things through a shattered human perspective when we think we can do anything without God. We know we are looking through a shattered human perspective when our hearts aren't broken, when the image of God and the dignity of God in another human being is being overlooked or hurt. 
If what is happening doesn't cause us to weep and go, no, no, the value and the beauty of their eternal dignity must be held in God's hands and be fought for. We know we're seeing through, the, through that perspective of shattered humanity when we, when, whenever we do causes division. Our God's called us to call forth peace and hope and love and truth and, and give God's glory for it to be seen in everything. And one of the ways to help us maybe understand this is to know that humanity keeps trying to recreate God in their own image, but through a perverted and distorted perspective. That's why we live in such a broken world right now. Because we're trying to recreate God in our perspective, our distorted, perverted perspective of the brokenness. But the goal in the heart that God has for everyone, that he wants you to live a flourishing life. He wants you to live a life where you are surrounded and shaped, not by, not by the shattered perspective, but by who you were supposed to be, who he created you to be. And there is only one answer to that shattering, one answer to the deception that shapes us and keeps us all in bondage. And if you flip over to Romans chapter five, I want to read a section here. And it really, you could, I could read all of Romans five because Paul talks a lot about this, this whole chapter. In Romans chapter five, verse 17, it says this. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation to everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness on the cross brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. You and I, if we're gonna flourish, we need to quit looking first and foremost through the broken perspective of broken humanity, and we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. All right, that we will only flourish when we gaze upon life through a pure revelation of Jesus. That's when we flourish, when we keep our eyes fixed on a pure revelation of Jesus. Let's, let's just get really, really practical with this, okay? Really simple. How many of you have had some drama at work? Any, any takers on it? <laughs> had some drama at work, all right? And do you work with anyone else? You've had drama, okay. Um, how many of you have had some drama in a relationship? <laughs> like, hey, how many of you have been by yourself and had drama, right? It doesn't, you don't even need the other person, you just do it by yourself. How many of you have had drama at home and you're with spouse and kids and others, right? How many, how many have had drama in your finances? How, how many can admit we all face drama, all right? Again, it makes really good television. Not real fun to live in, but it makes really good television. When you're facing drama, if you, here's how I'm going to help you see it. If you can, you're seeing it through the shattered view first. If you are looking through the shattered view of humanity, it's going to, you're going to respond this way. My identity is wrapped up in how this situation turns out. So if this situation turns out good, my identity will be good. If this situation turns out bad, my identity will be bad. So there's an anxiety in me because I, I will either be walked on or I will be victorious. My identity, right? I'm going to be either labeled as being somebody who's walked on or somebody who's victorious. If, if I'm seeing it through a shattered view, that drama that I'm facing, it is up to me to make something happen. So if somebody else stands in my way, it's okay if I push past them. Because I need to get, because it's up to me, it's my responsibility to make sure something right happens in this situation so I can push past somebody else. If I'm looking at that drama from a shattered view, a shattered perspective that says, you know what, this is tough, but I can do this. I can do this. I, I know God is there and I know what should be right, but I have discipline and I have goodness on my side. And therefore, I can make this right. If you are looking from a shattered perspective, there you won't see a win in this for us. But you are going to see it as they are wrong, they are evil, they are broken, my perspective is right. Does that relate with any of us? Or when we walk through, that's, that's when looking through the shattered view first. But if we would take that same drama at work, in our relationships, at home, in our finances, in, in, in our pe the people in life that we're doing it, and we instead say, no, I want a pure revelation of Jesus first, 
Now I start by looking at that situation and go, you know what? My identity is unfazed because I stand eternally with God. He has called me to be eternally. So whether, however the situation turns out, it doesn't have an impact on who I am in Jesus. Right? I am anchored in his reality for eternity. And when I, when I have a pure revelation of Jesus, I realize I have a God-given responsibility and I have a God-given authority in the midst of this drama, in the midst of this situation, to bring peace and order to it. I'm responsible to God to bring peace and order to this situation, and I must do it by protecting the dignity of everyone involved. That is my authority. That is my responsibility. God has told me that I must do that in this moment. When facing that drama, I have a pure revelation. If I say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to pause for a minute, and I'm going to worship God, and I'm going to listen to his voice. And as I hear his voice, then I am going to speak forth what he says, and I'm going to speak forth hope and life and purpose into this situation, and I'm going to hold back all of my brilliance, because Lord knows I got lots of it, and I'm going to let his voice be the first voice that speaks into this moment and this situation. And if I have a pure revelation of God, I'm going to pray and believe that there is a creative and beautiful way for God to be exalted in it. Do you see the difference? Or we all live in, in a world that's so impacted by this distorted, broken view of the, the shattered image of God in us. And God's saying, no, you still can live with goodness and hope and that I created within you and placed within you and restored within you through Jesus. If, if I'm only looking through the shattered perspective, why is there such anxiety in our world and our culture today? Because whenever you're trying to figure out the right thing to do in this perspective, anxiety is going to trigger it's going to be too much. I got to figure this out. There's going to be this. There's going to be pressure. There's all those things are just going to rise up within me. I will push other people away. I will isolate myself. I'll reduce the dignity of other people and I will push God out. But if I stop and say, no, 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 I want to see a pure revelation of Jesus. I want to see him. There is a perspective that will bring peace and create unity and fulfill your purpose and keep you focused on Jesus. We live in a broken world, right? This is a broken world that we live in. It is shattered. And most of the perspectives are shattered perspectives. But God is saying, because of Jesus, you don't need to be trapped in that shattered perspective anymore. You don't have to be trapped. That doesn't have to be what holds you, what defines you. And he's saying, no, no, you will only flourish when you gaze upon life through the pure revelation of Jesus. That's when you'll flourish, when you stop and go, no, 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 hold on a second. Which way am I looking through that, at this through? Am I looking through the shattered image or am I looking through back at Jesus, the pure revelation of who God has created us and wants us to be? If you read back in Psalm 92, this is, this is from that perspective. This is why in Psalm 92, where a lot of us, when we first read it, we're like, oh, that's nice and cheery. But that's how God wants us to live Right? He wants us to live that way, that, that you should sing and celebrate and rejoice in the beauty of God. That we can remember that wickedness is temporary. God's goodness is eternal. Wickedness is temporary. And you were created in God's image. And therefore, God will give you the strength to regain your purpose and your, glory and your, and your understanding of who you are in him that you were destined to flourish. You are destined to flourish your entire life. Not just for a little bit. No, your entire life. You flourish and you, you give everything that you have because God is good and he is just and he is worthy. What you and I need more than anything else is we need a pure revelation of Jesus. That's my prayer for us today. Going into this week, going, Lord, help remind me again. I want to see you. I want to see you high and lifted up. I don't, I don't want to see you. I don't want to look at just the shattered reflection of broken humanity and let that guide me. I want to see Jesus. In the book of Isaiah, the people of God at that time had been living out the shattered view of humanity. 
They had lost all perspective. They were doing things wrong left and right. They were defying people's dignity. They weren't, weren't working together in unity. They were dividing all the things that come through that shattered perspective. And God needed to raise someone up to speak hope and life. In Isaiah chapter six, verse four, it says this. It was the year that King Uzziah died. And Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And their voices, they shook the temple to its foundations. And the entire building was filled with smoke and awe. And then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed because I am a sinful, broken man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies, and he knew he would die. But then one of the seraphims flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. And catch this. Then I heard the Lord speaking. It wasn't until he was forgiven. It wasn't until he turned and saw the reality and God cleansed me. He said, then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Proclaiming hope and love, and truth, and change. And he said, here I am, send me. It wasn't until Isaiah got a pure revelation of God that he humbled himself, acknowledged his sin, and his perspective changed. When his sins were forgiven, then he could hear God's voice. Do you want to see a change in the world around you? Do you want to see things begin to flourish in ways that they didn't flourish before? It is so important that we, like Isaiah, be captivated by the presence and the glory of God. Let's pray. God, we come together today. And we just, Lord, we just thank you for what you placed inside of us. We thank you, God, for how good you are, for the life that you've created. Lord, we, we come together and we say, worthy is your name. We come together and we say, you deserve praise. That you are exalted in the heavens. God, let your glory fill this place. Lord, we know that we live in a brokenness, in a broken world that causes us to see the pain and the shattered image of who you've created us to be. But Lord, you have not abandoned us. You did not leave us. In fact, Jesus, you came and you lived and went to the cross so that each of us could be in relationship with you again. As I said in Romans, God, so that we can have a, a right relationship, a righteousness within us, that our relationship with you can be restored, that we can have a, a better picture of what it means to reflect your glory, to be like Isaiah, to hear your words and be willing to proclaim them, to bring hope, to bring truth, to stop and think in those moments when we want to react, when we want to respond, when we want to take over and remember, no, no, no. The deceiver is telling me that I can flourish without God, but I know that I flourish, have a healthy, vigorous life when I keep my perspective on a pure revelation of Jesus first. And if you've given your life to Jesus and you know it today, can you just begin to worship him right where you're at? 
Just begin to thank him. God, thank you that you've placed a piece of you in me. I don't deserve it. God, thank you that there's eternal dignity in everyone around me. God, thank you for the authority and the responsibility that you've given us to hear your voice and to speak forth truth and hope. God, I pray that there would be creativity and goodness and love that just pours out. Lord, I want to see you high and lifted up in my life over and over again. No matter what brokenness is around me, I want to see you. Maybe you're here today. And as many are praying that you would just, maybe today as we were talking through this, you're like inside, you've always felt that there was something that should be different. In fact, you're really here at church today because something drew you. Something should be different than what it is. And God's speaking to you today and reminding you that he has called you. He has spoken into you. He went to the cross to redeem you, to bring a right relationship back into your life. And if you're here today and you're, you're saying, you know what, Pastor Brian, I just need, I need to see that pure perspective of Jesus. The brokenness that's been in me has been what's driving me. It's been hurting. It's been changing. It's been in charge. But today, I need Jesus to be what I see. Will you help me pray with me so that I can see Jesus? If that's you, I want to pray with you today. And, and just best while you're just sitting there, no one else looking around, can you just put a hand up? I just, if that's your heart today, I just want that. I want, I want to know Jesus that way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Up in the balcony as well. Yeah. Several hands. Thank you. You can put your hands down if you have to have them up. And what I want you to do is just say a simple prayer like this. Just for each of us, just in our hearts, just saying, Jesus, I know that there's brokenness in me. I know that I've not fulfilled all that you have placed within me. I've stepped on other people's dignity. I've taken advantage of things. And I've tried to do most of life on my own. But today... I believe that Jesus is the only pure source of life, that he is my creator and that he went to the cross to give his life so that I could have a right relationship with you. So more than anything else today, I choose Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for your life and your hope. Open up my heart, open up my spirit so I can see you and your life can flow through me. The Bible says when we say a prayer simple like that, something like that, he begins to move in us. He begins to open up our eyes spiritually. He begins to move the shattered pieces of our life to help us be able to see him and know him and encounter him, to come together and to give him praise. So Jesus, we thank you today that we can glorify you and honor you, that you are good and you are majestic and you are holy.